Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming. Uh, so my name is Arnold Sikoma. I'm a professor of physics here at, at Trinity Western. Um, and I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, how this event came to be. So about a month ago, uh, we had, I think about six weeks ago, uh, we had a, a speaker here, a distinguished lecture a series, uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe from Texas Tech University. Um, and she spoke on climate change, facts, fictions, and our fate. I think the sound is not the greatest, right? It's fine. It's fine. It's okay. fine. It sounds to me like it's, it's a bit fine. I've noticed the dial is very sensitive, so try that. So, um, so that was a great lecture, and, and I was just curious, how many of you were, were, were there? At, uh, okay, excellent. So we have to... Uh, continued following from <laughs> on the topic of environmental science and so forth. Of course, some of you are in my class, so that's why you're here, some of you are here in other classes, so, so thanks for, for coming. Um, so, uh, Catherine's uh, uh, talk um, was obviously all about climate uh, science, and, and one of the um, things that people could address climate science with would be different uh, ways of producing energy, and you know, one of the Potential ways of thinking about energy would be nuclear nuclear power. Of course, nuclear power has been with us for, for a few decades in some parts of the world. It's changing in parts of the world, increasing and decreasing. Um, and there was a question uh, that was brought uh, um, in the Q and A session, actually by uh, someone who's here tonight again too. So Joy Kagawa, uh, who's a famous Canadian author and poet, uh, and so she asked about nuclear power. I asked Catherine Hale about that. She Catherine Hale seemed to indicate there were some serious problems with nuclear power. Um, and, and so as a, as a follow up with that, let's invite someone who knows about nuclear power and knows about some of the problems and challenges and as well as the opportunities of nuclear power to come and speak. And I want to thank, uh, thank Joy Kagawa for, for suggesting that we uh, connect with Patrick Walden from Triumph. So uh, that's, that's a bit of the background as to how we got here this evening. So uh, let me say a few words about um, how it's going to go this evening. So I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Walden here for a bit, and then he'll speak for about uh, 60 minutes, and then there will be plenty of time for a Q&A, and um, we promise that everybody will be able to be well done here by, by 9 o'clock. So, um, so uh, Patrick Walden got his Bachelor's of Science in, in Physics, honors uh, degree at the University of British Columbia, um, and after that he went uh, to Caltech for his uh, PhD, uh, and before finishing his PhD, he went to the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, uh, Slack, um, uh, where he wasn't very slack. Uh, he was working hard on pion production and finished his uh, PhD with working uh, there as well as continuing on doing a postdoctoral fellowship at Slack. And then he came back to Triumph. Um, I guess about 40 years ago, we started that at Triumph. Uh, Triumph is the, is the uh, accelerator facility at the, at the University of British Columbia. Some of you have. Uh, visited there, some of you who worked there. Um, so uh, while he was there, he built a 120-ton magnet magnetic spectrometer to run more experiments on, on pions. And, and um, I guess we're, that was around the early days of quarks and all of that, and trying to establish what is really going on inside nuclei. Uh, in the last few years of his work at Triumph, he's uh, he worked in nuclear astrophysics, thinking about nucleosynthesis. How do we get the elements uh, that we have? Uh, everything that's um, that you see around is made of uh, atoms uh, that were generated in um, in stellar processes. Um, so, and since his retirement from Triumph about four years ago, he's been thinking about uh, global population issues, uh, global warming, climate science, uh, nuclear energy, and has given various talks at various places, including one at the University of Fraser Valley called "Limits of Growth." Uh, and then we do have at least one person from the University of Fraser Valley here as well uh, this evening. So. Uh, so, um, now Pat is a member of the United Church of Canada, and in scheduling this event, we had to make sure we avoided his uh, choir practices because he sings in the church choir and they're doing Handel's Messiah uh, pretty soon. Uh, I don't know if that's open to the public, and you can tell us uh, all about when and where it is, um, and we'll maybe come out to that as well. So, uh, with him this evening uh, is his, his wife, Christine, um, and uh, they have two sons and also a granddaughter. So, um, uh, Thanks for coming tonight, uh, Patrick, and let's give uh, Patrick a welcome. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, before I begin, I will thank Arnold and uh, 
and uh, Trinity Western for giving me this wonderful sweat pot. I came here uh, several years ago looking for one, and uh, for some reason I couldn't find one in the bookstore. I think it's because they didn't have any TWUs, it's at Spartans instead. So uh, I'm happy to do this. But uh, before I begin, I'm going to take it off because I will presume I'll be sweating up here on the stage, uh, dying of heat uh, before the talk is over if I don't take this off now. So, you can excuse me. Just don't forget it here. Make sure you don't forget it. My other. So, uh, the title of the talk is uh, Nuclear Power Is It the Energy for the Future? And I hope I'm going to be able to convince you of that. I was going to say a few words about myself before beginning, but uh, Arnold has covered that uh, quite extensively. So, uh, I will just launch right into the, the, into the talk itself. Um, I, 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 I would say, yes, I'm. I'm I'm a, a particle physicist, nuclear physicist, nuclear astrophysicist, and uh, if I were giving you a talk on uh, what I do, yeah, I'd be one of the guys talking about something like the Higgs boson. This, I am not a nuclear expert, and I learned all of this since I retired, and I uh, looked into it very carefully, and uh, because I'm very concerned with uh, what is happening on this planet, and uh, global warming and uh, ways to mitigate global warming. And one of the ways, of course, is with uh, nuclear power. So what we have here is a, a diagram of uh, one of the most popular uh, or the, the, the most common nuclear reactor seen on, the, on this planet. It's a pressurized water reactor. And the uh, reaction which happens right here in the reactor vessel, is uh, heat, heats up the cooling water that flows through it. This reactor vessel is under 153 atmospheres of pressure, which is a lot. This is in order to be able to get this water up to uh, 353 degrees centigrade. Because the higher the temperature you can get, water coming out the top here, the more efficient will be the, uh, the, the nuclear reactor. So this uh, uh, cooling loop goes into the uh, steam generator. The steam generator is has the water boiled at 100 degrees Celsius. It goes into a turbine, it spins, generating electricity, which then goes and powers the city. The uh, exhaust has to be then cooled back into the water and the whole thing is recycled and to make things uh, what the steam condense you have to have a cooling loop here which is connected with uh, whatever device they use to cool the reactor but there's several devices that can be used and talking about what is needed to cool the reactor through this loop here is what actually got the talk started because uh, Catherine Tejo said that uh, getting enough water to cool the nuclear reactors was a problem. So, it, you notice that one thing that this uh, nuclear reactor doesn't produce is carbon dioxide. So, producing power, no carbon dioxide, it would seem to be a natural thing to use in order to mitigate global warming. But, it has a problem. We've had Three Mile Island, we've had Chernobyl, and we have Fukushima, and everybody's scared of building these things, and that is the main problem with nuclear power. Uh, all of these accents had a problem with the cooling water. Uh, because they lost power, they was, there wasn't any power to run this pump here. The water just stayed. The reactor fuel heated up, it melted. And it's at 300 and uh, 153 atmospheres. You can imagine this getting hotter and the pressure going up. And it can blow that container up. So 
and quickly came up and actually exploded. And they didn't have a containment structure here to keep it under control. So once it exploded, the whole contents went into the environment. And after Fukushima, it didn't explode, but they had to release the pressure, and in doing so, they spewed uh, radioactive material into the environment. Three Mile Island had a similar problem, but uh, its uh, consequences were much less severe. It spewed out just a little bit of radioactivity. In fact, it spewed out uh, very so little radioactivity that the uh, natural radiation background per year would have been larger than each person would have received from Three Mile Island. But all the uh, problems associated with the uh, with uh, nuclear reactors to date and these, these accidents have all become uh, water cooling. The current type of reactors they build now is called Generation 3. They are smaller, uh, simpler. They use less uranium per kilowatt hour of power out. And the other thing that they use is their water link is gravity fed, meaning that uh, once if you lose power, the water will still flow through the reactor and keep it cool. So uh, if you had a generation three reactor, instead of the ones they had at Three Mile Island or Chernobyl or Fukushima, they would have all passed through the, their incidents unscathed. They would have survived completely. So this is the, uh, is the type of reactor we're going to be talking about, because this is, if you're going to build a new reactor today, it will be a generation three or better, or a generation three plus. So, uh, and the other thing is, is these things are, are cheaper. They, they are prefabricated. The design is in the United States at least, it's pre-approved. I mean, they, they, there's an approved design, and they just manufacture most of it in the in the uh, well, like at Westinghouse. It'll just uh, I think it's General Electric that does it. They, they prefabricate it, and they'll just uh, send it to wherever they're going to put it and, and and build it there. Even safer are the Generation Four reactors. They will use molten salt. They are at atmospheric pressure, so they can't possibly blow things into the environment. <coughs> they have a, a failure. They're all, almost a fail-safe device. And they will also burn fuel, which is not burnt in the present reactors of the day. Uh, the present reactors only burn uranium-235. The new generation of four reactors will burn uranium-238 and will also burn thorium-232. And this will expand the fuel supply by at least a factor of 550 over what we have today. So we expect a big increase in the, in the amount of, of, of fuel available. So in viewing this, there are three very well-known climate scientists, Hansen, Valdiria, Emmanuel and Quigley. Jim Hansen, I think, is the one that is most familiar to you. He's the uh, face of the of, of, of science when it comes to talking to uh, governments, and people about uh, global climate change. And he's been after people since about 1990, trying to convince them that, they, they, that uh, something has to be done because uh, global warming is not <coughs> A theoretical thing. It's going to happen. It's coming. Nothing seems to be stopping it unless we stop emitting carbon dioxide. They, they, they all came to the conclusion that there, in order to avoid this global warming catastrophe, that the use of nuclear power had to be made. So they wrote an open letter. This was in November of uh, 2013. And they asked that environmental policymakers to stop their opposition to nuclear power. They said the quantitative analysis show that the risks associated with the expanded use of nuclear energy are orders of magnitude smaller than the risks 
associated with fossil fuels. And this, by this they mean generation three and generation four reactors. We also pointed out that no energy system is without its downsides, including renewables. And they asked that only energy system decisions be based on facts and not on emotions and biases that do not apply to 21st century nuclear technology. I'm afraid there is a lot of emotion and biases being applied to nuclear energy today. Finally, they said, while it may be theoretically possible to stabilize the climate without nuclear power, in the real world, there is no credible path to climate stabilization that does not involve a substantial role for nuclear power. And we can ask, why did they say this? And I'm going to attempt to show you why. In uh, August of uh, 2012, Bill McKibben, who is the well-known founder of 350.org, who is advocating that we get off of fossil fuels, he's been the main forward on the side of the Keystone XL pipeline, and uh, he is the, uh, what shall we say, the gadfly of the uh, fossil fuel industry. He wrote in the Rolling Stone magazine, a most, I would say it was the best article on climate change I have seen in the past 10 years. Maybe it's the best ever. But he pointed out that for an 80% chance of not exceeding 2 degrees, degrees Celsius, we must not exceed emissions of 565 gigatons of CO2. Otherwise, we will probably exceed a global temperature rise of more than 2 degrees Celsius <coughs> and pass into the realm of what they call dangerous climate change. Now, in Copenhagen, almost every country in the world agreed that we should not go past this limit. And they were convinced that this was something to keep below. But unfortunately, things are not so simple. They did not specify how many, uh, had, uh, how, how they were to do it. They just agreed that it was not a good idea to exceed that, uh, that limit. So I want to give you an idea of what dangers we're talking about. Uh, this is the impact of global warming. This is what we have right now. We're warmed up by about 0.8 degrees Celsius. <coughs> we already have some species of extinction. We have oceans are warming. They're also not only warming, they are acidifying. We have heat waves. California is a good example. The Arctic ice cap is melting. It'll probably be gone by 2020, which is uh, the estimate. We know the sea levels are rising, and uh, we can see a mistake. Uh, this was done by an artist doesn't know the science very well, we have extreme weather events, that's only 0.8 degrees, how about 1 degree, rare species are extinct, coral reefs destroyed, island nations underwater, and that's not enough, we go to 2 degrees, Greenland ice cap melt, polar bears extinct, water supplies are effective, and we are not going to stop there. We are currently on track right now to go above six degrees warming at the present rate we are headed in emitting carbon dioxide. So we've got to talk about three degrees. We have environmental refugees, food shortages, Amazon collapses, and then if you're not depressed enough, we have millions of refugees, a third of Bangladesh underwater, the permafrost melts and gases are released. This is a real worry, <coughs> that one there, because if the permafrost melts and gases are released, we have run away global warming. We can shut down our CO2 emissions, but that stuff is still going to be emitted into the atmosphere. We won't be able to control it. It's too warm. Five degrees, most of the world uninhabitable. Earth is hotter than in 55 
million years, and we could be facing a possible uh, mass extinction. This is not because the world hasn't been six degrees warmer before. It's the speed at which it, it is occurring. We are not taking a million years to heat up by six degrees. It's taking about a hundred years to heat up by six degrees. That is a problem. Evolution does not have a chance to evolve and adapt to that rate of change. It says this is going to be worse than war, famine, plague, and global nuclear war. So this is what we are looking at. This, this I find scary. And I would like to keep the temperature below 2 degrees Celsius. So, what Ford and Bill McKibben have to say, in 2011, the world emitted 31.6 gigatons of CO2. Remember, we only got a limit of 565. The CO2 emissions are climbing at about 3.2% per year. And if you do the math, that means we have 14 more years of emitting as we are, have been doing until our carbon budget is used up. This means we are committed to go above 2 degrees Celsius in global warming. It won't be immediately, but there will be enough carbon in the atmosphere that eventually the Earth's systems will gradually heat up to go above 2 degrees Celsius. And the date for that, this was 2011 for these figures, is 2025. So that's only 11 years away. So I think something has to be done as soon as we can uh, do it. Uh, I would say that uh, Mark Shepard, is an economist at SFU, he says we have to get off of the carbon economy now. People are, have a hard time believing that. But it's true, we have to get off. So that means we cannot be increasing the fossil fuel industry or its infrastructure today. That means that there are no tar sands, no shale gas, no fracking, and no liquefied natural gas. And also no pipelines like the Eastall XL, Northern Gateway, Tinder Morgan, or otherwise. You have to look at shutting a scheme for shutting these things down. If you want to build these infrastructure and develop a fossil fuel, it must always be with reference to how you are going to bring on a non-fossil fuel economy and this, any developments of the fossil fuel industry has to have an eye towards getting off of it. And that is not happening. And this is what I find quite, quite upsetting. So, what's available for power? The greenhouse gas free power. I've listed them there. There's advanced nuclear, geothermal, biomass, hydro, wind, wind offshore, solar, photo, solar photovoltaic, and solar thermal. And uh, you can see this is the approximate cost in the terms of dollars per megawatt of uh, what we can currently producing for. This is actually an estimate for 2016 and it's given out by the U.S. Energy Information Administration. So I gather that this is neutral. They don't care what type of energy they're talking about. This is the, the figures they, they came up with. The other thing to look at is capacity factor. This is how long it can remain on. So for example, you have uh, bad stuff here is on for 90% of the time and uh, these things are off. They have to be down every now and then for, for maintenance and repairs. But all in all, the uh, top four are dispatchable, meaning that uh, you can turn them on and dispatch them to wherever you want to have the power whenever you desire it. The bottom four are non-dispatchable. They are completely a thing of nature. And wind, you may get it for $97 per megawatt hour, but it's only available 34% of the time. Wind offshore is the same. Solar is only available for 25% of the time, and solar thermal for 18% of the time. 
And this is what I call the uh, dark lining in the silver cloud. Gas at the same location. During the day, it generates as much electricity as the can using solar. At night, when it's cloudy, we use more natural gas. Each year, we probably get over 200 days of sunshine, but there's 165 more days of doubt. As big as this solar plant is, it's not enough to meet our customers' needs. The plant operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's why we need natural gas. Here at the plant, using solar and natural gas technology allows us to generate reliable power with as little impact on the environment as possible. This site is covered with eagles, alligators, pretty much any of the wildlife that you expect to see in Florida. It's our responsibility to take care of the land that surrounds our facility. I think what's important about combining solar and natural gas is to show that renewable energy and traditional energy can coexist. It's not a matter of either or. We need both. The biggest benefit to having two technologies is it ensures we can produce clean electricity whenever our customers need it. While incredibly challenging, it's also incredibly rewarding. Well, natural gas, despite what they say, is not clean. It produces CO2. And right now we are at an epoch where we have to get off of natural gas. So natural gas and solar cannot be combined. They are not compatible. We are, if you're still emitting CO2 to back up the solar. And the only reason why you're doing that is because solar is only dependable 25% of the time, according to the US statistics on it. And they're backing it up with fossil fuels. And this is the dark lining in the silver cloud, which is not readily apparent to everybody. When you're trying to increase the amount of renewables you'll have, you'll probably go up to maybe about 40%, and then you'll reach a, a, uh, a, a, a limit. Because to go above that, you need something that's more dependable than wind or solar. So let, let, let's see if we can not do something to try and increase the, the amount of, of renewable energy that, that, that's available to us. So I went through this little exercise here, and I have a location. It's the local location. We have renewable energies. I use wind in this case. And then to uh, back it up, I use the uh, combined cycle gas turbine. This is about the cheapest way to produce energy today. And it is natural gas, which emits the least amount of uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour, <coughs> but it emits uh, car the carbon dioxide nevertheless. So if we take a look at the cost of this, for local or only, we have uh, 34 percent of the time the renewable is on, but it has to be backed up 66% of the time with the combined cycle gas turbine. You have to build enough wind infrastructure to supply 100% power when wind is available, but when the wind is not available, you must also build up enough infrastructure to combine to supply 100% power with the gas turbine. So if you take a look at combining those two, this is not $97 per megawatt hour, this is going to cost you more per megawatt hour. So let's say we try to get that percentage up from 34 to something higher by when using a second location that's uh, quite a bit distance. Uh, and uh, when the wind is off at the first location, hopefully the wind will be on at the second location. 
and you can get the power from there. However, at the second location, they want, when the wind is on, they will want to use their wind for their own purposes. So that means you have to build another infrastructure to supply wind power to the first location. And because this is tip for tap, we'll also have to build a second infrastructure for wind at the first location to supply the second location when uh, they need it, when their wind is off. And you have to do this over a transmission line. I have not put the cost of such transmission lines in this calculation, but if we have uh, two locations, you if it will Renewables will be available 56% of the time. We'll have to use the combined cycle gas turbine 44%. And because you've had to build some more infrastructure there, the costs are now $233 per megawatt hour. The price has gone up. You can continue this little exercise. You can go to three locations. Now you can supply 71% renewables, but the price is now $324 per megawatt hour. But it doesn't matter. You can keep on doing this at infinitum. You'll never get renewables supplying 100% of the power 100% of the time. It's just a fact of life. The only way they can do it is they're going to have to store the energy. And that technology does not exist at the moment. Remember, we're looking at a 10-year time horizon to really try to get off of fossil fuel. We're talking about storage. Right now, there are a few locations where they do store uh, renewable energy. One is in Denmark. What they do is they take their extra energy and they pump water uphill into a dam in Norway, which they can then use to uh, supply power for Denmark and I gather the Norwegians uh, because they have to pay for the use of their lakes, their, their bellies and whatnot. So that, 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 that is the situation. We, I mean, if you go to Kansas, there's no place to pump water uphill in, in Kansas. So uh, what do you do? You're, 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 you're stuck with using these backup uh, fossil fuel generators. So non-dispatchable renewables cannot supply 100% of the power 100% of the time. So you need to have dispatchable power which does not emit any greenhouse gases to cover the downtime. You cannot use combined cycle gas turbine because it emits CO2. What do we have? What choices are there? Well, there's hydro. That's clean. The only trouble is hydro does not exist in Kansas. There's geothermal. The only trouble is geothermal does not exist in Kansas. There's biomass. If you take a look at some biomass facilities, they are, are burning logs. It also competes with food production and arable land to do this. And it has an air pollution problem because it is burning stuff and you will have that in the atmosphere, even though that you're just putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that was taken out recently. But you have a problem if you want, if you, you have a population that's going to increase from 7 billion currently to 10 billion in the future, you want to use all the arable land you have in order to grow food. What's left? Advanced nuclear. But it too has problems, just like uh, that letter said at the opening, all power systems have their problems. So let's talk about these problems. The main problem on everybody's mind is radiation risk. So this is the current state of our knowledge about radiation risk. The lowest approximate dose known that actually is responsible for cancer risk is 100 millisieverts. That risk is about half a percent. That means if you get 100 millisieverts all at once, you have a half a percent chance of developing cancer in the future. But, uh, uh, but, but uh, it's, it's not absolutely guaranteed, 0.5%. What is the 
seabird. Anyways, getting a seabird is a dose where you deposit one joule of energy into one kilogram of material. <clears throat> right, your your body will so weigh uh, 90 kilograms. That's the same. I weigh about 90 kilograms. So uh, if I deposited 90 seabirds into my body, I would, I would uh, 90 joules into my body. I would have a one sievert dose of radiation. So, what are current limits? Let's take a look at some of the current limits. Try it. You can occupy any space 24/7, 365 days a year, as long as the radiation fields are below one micro sievert per hour. That's a millionth of a sievert per hour. At Triumph, we limit the doses for our workers to 10 millisieverts per year. And if you divide that by uh, the number of hours in a year, you get 1.14 microsieverts per hour. It's pretty close to what the 24-7 limit is. Radiation workers all around the world are limited to 20 or 50 millisieverts a year. And this is considered to be harmless because they get these doses throughout the entire year. I mean, if you get 100 millisieverts all at once, you have a half a percent chance of developing a cancer. If you take 10 years to get this 100 millisieverts, the uh, chances that you'll get a cancer are considerably less because the body does have the ability to repair itself. So let's take a look at more things here. If you go for a dental x-ray, you get a dose of 0.15 millisieverts. The natural background around us is radioactive. The average dose you'll get around the world is about four millisieverts per year. If you uh, get too much radiation, radiation poisoning first starts to show some symptoms at 400 millisieverts. This is, you receive it all at once. You get severe radiation poisoning at two sieverts. And if you get four sieverts or more, you can die of it. If it's uh, four sieverts, you, can, uh, you may have a 50% chance of surviving if you get immediate medical treatment. Otherwise, death is quite likely. So, now that we know what radiation risks are, um, let's see, if I passed, yeah, that's what I want. Let's go sunbathing on a radioactive beach in Brazil. Okay? This, this is a little little, uh, little uh, uh, film clip by a girl, she's a German graduate student, she calls herself BioNerd23. I was trying to find out who he is, but she keeps her identity well hidden, and uh, probably because of attention from videos that she puts on, on the internet. So anyway, let's listen to this uh, video of hers. She's taken this at, uh, in, in the beach in Brazil called Lupari. It's just part of Rio de Janeiro. When we think of radioactive contaminated places in the world, we might be thinking of Chernobyl or Fukushima, or maybe we're thinking about the Bikini Assault, for example, where nuclear bombs have been tested. But who of us would think about places like this? A beach somewhere, a beautiful beach with tourists. This is not a place where it has been, for example, a uranium mine. You know, uranium mine tailings that are known to expose the public to additional radiation, but that would be man made as well. But this, this is all natural. This natural radiation, it is not some man made tailing site or whatever. This is a naturally radioactive beach. This beach contains water dye sand, which again contains the radioactive element thorium, which has a half life of 14 bits. Well, the sun's shining on it, but as you can read that, there's 56 microsieverts an hour. Remember that the limit at triumph was one microsievert an hour. This 56. This is a tourist beach. Anybody can go there. There's no restrictions. In fact, I don't even think they tell you that it has radioactivity on it when you go romping around. 
There are children romping around on it too. They even buy bananas, which they drop in the sand and then they brush it off and, 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 and eat later. And <clears throat> this I found phenomenal. I mean, when I started to, to research uh, what was uh, happening, the world had lost my point of view. Down there, come back. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, I was amazed. This this blew my mind. I mean, I was totally flabbergasted at this. And I looked into this, and as far as I can see, there are no chronic health problems reported by the residents of Kupari due to radiation. And they get a substantial amount of radiation during the year. Now let's take a look at another place. This may be more familiar to you. This is the city of Pripyat in the Chernobyl zone. Pripyat is right beside the Chernobyl sarcophagus where the nuclear accident took place. And we have BioNerd 23 again to give us a tour. <laughs> so this is the main square of Pripyat. Yep, see that? That's 0.5 micro sieverts an hour. This is in the abandoned city of Pripyat. People have been removed from there. Now, it's been about 30 years since the uh, the Chernobyl disaster, and the main radiation you're looking at there is caused by cesium-137, and it happens to have a 30-year half-life. So, in the beginning, that 0.5 would have been one. Okay. Beginning. There would have been some other stuff there, like iodine 131 or cesium 134, so the, the rates would have been higher than one. However, they have short half lives and they would be soon gone, at least in half a year, that stuff would be gone, and you would have had just one microceiver an hour uh, remaining after about a half a year after the external disaster. But this is an abandoned city, and it's going to stay an abandoned city for. I don't know how long. So, uh, uh, Bounder 23 wasn't quite uh, oh, satisfied. You can he, see wanted a he wanted to find something that was hotter. So she wandered around. Let's see, but uh, here we are. She found this place. Yeah. What? Okay. I finally found something that was hotter than the point flat. Finally, they, the, uh, her guides told her that the real hot spots were actually the moss with the lichen growing on the concrete. So let's take a look and see how about the. Uh, uh, let's see if the water is contaminated. It wasn't. I'm trying to move the line here. Oh, here we go. Yeah, okay. Okay, we're coming to. She's going to start picturing. Like it. Okay. All right. 1.5 microsievert. Our guy just told us to get close to the moss. And indeed, you can see. Have to wait a while until it adjusts, but it's about. Here we are, 16. That's the hot spot in Kirkia. 16. As compared to being bathed at 56 micrometers per hour on a Brazilian beach. Now, this is sort of typical of the Chernobyl zone, but there are places in Chernobyl which are very hot. I'll tell you that right now. There's a place called the Red Forest, which looks like the Reactor core of Chernobyl blowing into the air, floated for a little while, came down a few miles from the reactor in a place that's known as the Red Forest. All the pine needles turned red. That's why it's called Red Forest. Today, it looks somewhat normal. It's a green forest again, <laughs> but uh, there's a road that goes through it, and uh, Everybody takes a, trip, a tour of Chernobyl now. I mean, you know that it's open for tourist traffic now. I mean, if you really want to go visit Chernobyl, you can 
actually contact the Ukrainian government and get a tour there. That was before they had the troubles, of course, and I don't know what, what, what it is right now. But this is how Final Nord 23 got there. She uh, applied to, to get a tour. When she got out in the Red Forest, she went out and put her meter down right on the moss and the ground, and it read 350 mushroom sieverts an hour. There was still life there. I mean, they have uh, dormice there, which they keep in a little box, and they take out every now and then to see what troubles they have. They record there's about 6% Uh, okay, malnormalities or, 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 or mal mutations, but uh, that's only about twice what they see in the non radiated zone. But I mean, life still goes on at 350 microsieverts an hour. Amazing. But it is, I wouldn't recommend you saying that definitely might anyways. When uh, Bio Third Bio Nerd Twenty Three came home, she had a dosimeter with her, so she measured what sort of dosage she had for her two days stay in uh, Chernobyl, which also included a trip to the Red Forest. She got a, a dose of 100 microsieverts. <laughs> in her trip to Brazil, she had a little bit more figuring to do, but after she was figuring. And out she came to the conclusion that she received 240 microsieverts on the Brazilian beach. And this, she wasn't on the beach all the time. She had to go off and on. In fact, if she stayed on that beach at the present dosage rate for 24, uh, for 24 hours and uh, for the two whole days, that means 48 hours, she would have received 10 times that dose, which would be uh, uh, 2,200. Uh, Somewhat, but uh, she, uh, she she uh, only received 240. If I calculate how much dosage you would get for the year at uh, Chernobyl, you would receive 18 millisieverts for a year. That is approximately two CT scans worth of radiation. So that's if you go and get a CT scan. That's 10, 10 millisieverts per CT scan. That's 18. In uh, Brazil, about 43 millisieverts per year. And uh, she was off and on. I mean, Uparia's industry is focused on that beach, that tourist beach. So this is, should be typical about what a Upari resident should receive a year, somewhere around 40 uh, millisieverts per year. So this is what you have to think about, is ponder the case between Upari, Brazil, and what you've seen in Chernobyl. So let's take a look at uh, really what the impact of Chernobyl was. The total number of deaths that can be attributed to Chernobyl is 50 deaths. Most of these were received by radiation poisoning in the first day of the catastrophe because they had to put out a fire on the roof of the reactor and you went up there and you if you didn't have any protection you would receive a lethal dose of radiation 31 people died of <coughs> dose of radiation nine more people died of thyroid cancer now there are four thousand cases of thyroid cancer but the soviet authorities are mainly responsible for this because they didn't tell anybody for 48 hours and that all their children drink milk produced by cows that ate grass that was contaminated by iodine-131. And they had a huge dose given to their thyroid. They estimated that they had a dose of about 500 millisieverts to their thyroid. And this resulted a few years later in about 4,000 cases of thyroid cancer, of which nine victims died. The rest of the accidents, the rest of the deaths were <laughs> physical accidents like a, a helicopter crash while they're trying to douse the, uh, the uh, journal of a rooftop with water. There's the Chernobyl Council. They looked at the dosages that uh, the population have a whole got, and they estimated there 
number will be uh, 4,000 deaths of um, cancer based on the LMP model. Now, I didn't uh, really go into the LMP model. We'll just go back there for a quick second. There we are. The LMP model. That's this model here. They have no data. Oh, 100. Let me see of what happens. So what the uh, authorities have done is they just said, well, let's extrapolate it linearly and uh, use that as the basis for setting radiation limits for nuclear radiation workers and whatnot. You could also have this, which means nothing happens up to a certain level, and then it's all. This means that the body is repairing itself from radiation damage. And you can see this. I mean, if you have a gamma ray going through your body and it splits a, a, a biological mo uh, molecule in two and it's a waste, you can go up through your urine. The body will get rid of it. Uh, the body also goes up and down your DNA strands looking for mistakes. If it sees a mistake, it will correct it. So it's believable that this is what happens. But nobody knows. Or even some people who say that the radiation is beneficial going down here like this. I find it hard to believe. And there's other people who say that we have hypersensitivity to radiation. And I think that's even more difficult to believe. But anyways, it's on the basis of this LMP model right here, which has all probabilities for low doses of radiation. And if you take a look at small probabilities, uh, something about, uh, let's say, 0.01% of uh, developing a cancer, and you have a population of about a million people that you distributed to, you are going to predict that you're going to get some deaths. And so what uh, the Chernobyl Forum did was uh, maybe this very small probability of anything happening to you and multiplying by this huge number of people who actually received a little bit of radiation, they predicted that there'd be 4,000 deaths from cancer based on the LMP model. The only trouble is that this is statistically insignificant. You can't detect this. This will cause no change in the background cancer rate. This will be it's statistically equivalent to zero, in other words. It will be undetectable. It will, it, it, it will be as if, if you turn will never happen, everybody was given the dose that they were given, nobody would notice anything as, as time went through. But they, they did predict 4,000 deaths. The greatest medical problem to the survivors has been psychological and not radiological, being uprooted from your home and your and your environment and shipped off to some crappy apartment in uh, Kiev. It doesn't do anything to your, your, your well-being or your, your self-esteem. And this, this causes a lot of trouble to uh, you and you may start smoking and whatnot. It's, it's, uh, so the biggest problem has been psychological. The other thing to note is that the ecosystem around Chernobyl is healthy, intact, albeit radioactive. Well, let's just take a look at this healthy radio, this healthy uh, ecological system around the uh, uh, This is not what I'm here for. This is the uh, exclusion zone. <laughs> the watch guard of the tower said that the wild horses were seen nearby not too long ago, so after waving down to my friends from this dodgy, very shaky old tower, <laughs> I decided to uh, press on and actually look for the wild horses. Scanning the horizon, but you can't see them yet. However, our guide knows the direction of them, so let's we'll see if we can find them. And yes, there they are. In quite a distance behind the hill. But they haven't been See there's insects flying around? One quarters. Here are the birds. There's another one. Yet another one joined you. Beautiful animal. 
let's go to a peaceful moment where she's just observing them. So, and uh, not healthy Lee and had healthy offspring. So the population was rising to about 65 of these horses, but it's now declining again. Still, studies did not show any radiation-related illnesses, <coughs> but it's more like wolves. There's a growing population of wolves in the tribal wild zone that hunt these horses, as well as poor Ukrainians, with the zone being easier and easier to access, illegally, of course. But they go in there, they hunt the horses, they kill the horses, because they don't have anything to eat from. So, Video as well. So, yeah, it's kind of fascinating to see that these mammals managed to live healthily to have healthy offspring in the radiation zone and now are threatened. Growing population of wolves. <laughs> the usual. But now I'll let you watch the last minute and conclude generation. Okay, yeah, there are Enjoy the husky wild horses of the Tremble and Slimza. Chernobyl is one of the largest wildlife preserves in the world now. The wolf population there, it is, has expanded so that there are many wolves there in that Chernobyl zone as would exist in the wilderness. There are also other top predators like eagles and, and, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, uh, Fox. <laughs> and these horses are actually imported and uh, they, they're thriving quite nicely. If you watch the video, you can hear the buzzing of the flies, meaning uh, they're not been radiated. You can see they're switching their tails. You can hear the birds tweeting in the background. I mean, it's uh, just what you would expect of a an environment uh, ecosystem. And this is the worst possible scenario for a nuclear accident. You can't imagine a worse nuclear accident than what had happened at Chernobyl. And this is how it affects the, the ecosystem. It's radioactive, but it's still there. Global warming, your ecosystem is going to be destroyed. So let's look at Fukushima. These were the deaths at Fukushima. I mean, not deaths. Uh, this is the doses at Fukushima. You can see that uh, uh, 13,000 received less than 10 millisieverts of radiation. That's less than a, a CT scan. Another 3,000 were between uh, 50 and 100. Uh, 100 were, uh, uh, let's see, I think that's say these things. 134 received between 100 and 150, all the way up to here. Six received more than 250, and I think they two actually received more than 600. The everybody who got doses have shown no ill effects from their experience. Even those who got 600 million sieverts, nobody got over a sievert of, of radiation. Nobody got enough to be. Uh, show symptoms of radiation poisoning, and nobody was uh, died from the, from the doses they got. You can see <laughs> the population 10 to 50 millisieverts, 1 to 10 millisieverts, 0.1 to 10, etc. The, the doses were there, they were higher, but they were not anything that was considered life threatening. I should point out that they had a second facility down here, Fukushima, Miami. This is the one that they that, that had the, the, uh, uh, the explosion, the hydrogen explosion. The uh, Fukushima, Miami, it uh, had at least one power line and one generator work after the, uh, it was hit by the tsunami and the earthquake. And that nuclear facility came through unscathed. Had their problems, but they, they survived it, and and uh, they did not have a uh, meltdown or a uh, radiation release. So what happened at Fukushima? There were no deaths, none whatsoever, as far as we know. No projected deaths. Who decided that for taking very small probabilities, 
multiplying by huge numbers of people was a meaningless number that just freaked people out. Though they did not release such numbers, all they said is that the increased cancer rates will be not detectable against the background of cancer risk. And again, the greatest medical problem for the evacuees is psychological and not radiological. And the radiation released by Fukushima was one fifth of the amount of Chernobyl. And presumably, even though I have not had the BioNerd 23 visit the area, that their ecosystem is intact. So, the question is is nuclear energy safe? This is a study that was done uh, by uh, Cruitt et al. Uh, in a publication called Risk Analysis. And this is what he came up with that years per terawatt hour, that means years of life lost per terawatt hour given up. And you can see by far the, the worst culprit is coal. Actually, the worst culprit is lignite coal, which is important for Germany, but I decided not to show that. Uh, then you have gas. Look at solar. Solar is, is uh, worse than uh, gas, according to this study, probably because of the uh, the uh, chemicals and whatnot that you have to use in order to produce photosynthetic cells. And followed by nuclear and wind is the safest. It should be pointed out that 16 years per terawatt hour for nuclear um, uh, years like cloth due to estimates from the Allen T model, which is again very small probabilities multiplied by a large number of people. If you could believe that the LNT model works for very low doses, then maybe that's right. You take out the LNT model, this is sort of what you get. This is deaths per watt. Nuclear is down here. You take out the LNT probabilities. And then you have oil. <coughs> so, I would say that you, you, can, you can believe what you want to about the radiation problems. I've shown you the evidence. You can make up your own mind about what you've just seen. The other thing about nuclear power is they, some people claim it's not free. It's too much CO2 and the mining process. This is a study by, uh, uh, by the IPCC. This shows you how much uh, grams of kil uh, carbon dioxide or uh, greenhouse gas equivalent emitted per kilowatt hour. And you can see that uh, nuclear energy is down here with the rest of the uh, low emission uh, rate uh, power sources. You can see this coal, oil, natural gas. This is what you get if you put in uh, carbon question. Green, uh, whatever it is, the red CC that carbon capture and sequestering. Now that's what it is. You even put that in for coal or natural gas, it's still going to be higher in, in emitting carbon dioxide than these other types. So I don't really think carbon sequestering is is a, is a viable option. It's just something to uh, allow the coal industry to keep on going, pretending that they'll solve their problems with that. Uh, Oh, yeah. here, here are the numbers behind that graph. You can see that uh, people in the 50th percentile. Nuclear is 16, wind is lower, ocean energy is lower, hydropower is very low, but geothermal is 45, solar, photovoltaic is 46, 22, biopower is 18. So, nuclear energy is just says, uh, uh, it keeps the greenhouse gases emissions down just like everybody else. And this is a life cycle. This includes capital, building the, 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 the facilities, running it, and uh, decommissioning it. So this is the whole life cycle. This is uh, what you call uh, uh, it's the levelized emissions per kilowatt hour for the entire life cycle of a nuclear plant or a uh, wind uh, farm or a, 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 a coal plant and you can see that uh, the emissions are very low. So 
we have to admit that they're green. This is the question that, that brought me here with water problems. Now, this shows various types of, of power, like wind, it uses only zero gallons. Uh, solar voltaic uses up, what is that, about 16 mercury from here. But natural gas uses up uh, 198 gallons. Oh, it's, uh, these these thumbs are, are all using wet cooling. That means evaporating water to cool the, uh, the, 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 the plant. Natural gas runs at a high temperature and because it's very efficient. It has a low uh, call for uh, water cooling. Most of the power is used for producing uh, electricity. But you can see these less efficient uh, types use up huge quantities of, of water in their cooling power system, cooling power method. But if we uh, changed our uh, technology and uh, started cooling like the uh, car radiator, the car is using water but it's cooled by the air. Uh, and this is solar thermal with wet cooling, this is solar thermal with dry cooling, like the car radiator. Solar thermal has to go for this because uh, Marketplace put this in the dead desert, there's very little water. So you can see if uh, there is no reason why these power plants can't use the same type of, uh, of a solution. It just means that the their efficiency will be will drop. It won't get as many kilowatt hours per ton of fuel, but they can go to the uh, dry cooling and uh, lock down the amount of water they need for cooling substantially. So here are the water problems. There is the one that uh, they like to use most is called what's true cooling. This means that you uh, take a river and you run it through the nuclear reactor and uh, cool it down. You uh, cause the river to go up by just a few degrees and uh, uh, it, so that it doesn't harm the environment. You sign agreements with uh, the powers to be that you won't discharge water into the environment above a certain temperature. Uh, one place that they use this is in uh, Diablo Canyon. And this is in California where they're having the present drought. They use ocean water and they're unlikely to run out of water during the California drought. The, uh, uh, this, this, is, this is the, when they say nuclear power has water problems, this is what they refer to, running a river through the the nuclear reactor. They don't have to do this and the reason why they shut down because of water problems is that in very hot summers the water temperature of the intake is too high and the outlet temperature will be above what they've agreed to uh, exhaust their, their water into the environment as. So they have to shut down because their outlet water temperature is too high. They don't want to destroy the environment but if we have global warming to get hotter anyway, environment's shot, those agreements are likely to go out the window. There's evaporating coolant, that's what I was showing you on the previous slide. You can be invented here as well. The largest nuclear station in the U.S. is, uh, is Palo Verde, 3.3 gigawatts of power. It's in the middle of a desert, right next to Phoenix. It runs on the Phoenix sewage water. And that is what they use for cooling. And you can say if there's not enough sewage water, there is also no Phoenix and no need for a nuclear reactor. So uh, you can be inventive in, 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 in your water problems. There's close cooling, like a water car radiator, not, a, not a use yet. But in generation four reactors, you can have molten salt cooling. It's got a higher temperature. It's more efficient. It'll become as efficient as that uh, natural gas uh, plant, which only uses about 100 gallons per uh, kilowatt hour. And, or you can uh, not dispense with water cooling altogether. I mean, it's it, it's the temperature of this reactor will be a thousand degrees Celsius. And all you have to do is expose it bring in some compressed air, which you've compressed, 
expose it to this thousand degrees, the air will expand like boom, like that, and you can use that to run a gas turbine, like a jet engine. So it's, a, it's, it, it's a, and then you can exhaust the, the air into the atmosphere. So we have no water problems whatsoever. So water problems are not a showstopper. The other question is, is it abundant? People say, well, there's not enough uranium to expand with. Well, this is where the uranium in the Earth's crust exists. That is Namibia, which is perhaps the uh, poorest uh, uranium mine in the world, with only 100 parts per million of uranium. That's the, the one that has the least amount of uranium, uh, uh, uranium per, per ton of material to mine. The ratio between high grade ore, which is up here, is high grade ore. And the low grade ore is about a factor of 100 to 1. And the other thing you should point out, in the present environment of uh, nuclear reactors, you have to enrich the fuel from 0.7% uranium-235 to 3%. That's where the money is. That's what costs the nuclear fuel. So if you're talking about mining costs, mining costs are a small perturbation on the cost of nuclear fuel. So lower grade ores are not, uh, are not uh, 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 required. Let's see, what time is it? What's going on? It's getting quite late. I'm going to have to zip through this. So that you assume that uh, nuclear instantaneously uh, is produced. Uh, um, <laughs> if you assume that all nuclear, all nuclear is instantaneously, you know, if you take all the power necessary that's not produced by fossil fuels and nuclear, and uh, fossil fuels, sorry, and nuclear, and it's all run by nuclear, there is enough high quality ore to last 5.2 years, there's enough low quality ore to last 520 years, and if breeder reactors come in, there'll be enough power, uh, uh, enough fuel to last 300,000 years. So it is abundant. And when you hear people saying there's not enough fuel, they're referring to this figure here, 5.2. Nuclear waste problems. Uh, cheap underground storage is, uh, is an adequate solution. They can they bury them in rocks that have moved for billions of years. The Yucca Mountain Repository in Nevada is uh, was closed for political reasons, not for uh, technical reasons. Now that we've had a new election in the U.S. and the Republicans are in power, and uh, Harry Reid is no longer the Senate Majority Leader. They may well open up nuclear, uh, open up the, the Yucca Mountain for nuclear waste depository. The world's waste can be stored in areas the size of a couple of football fields. So, another way to get rid of nuclear uh, nuclear waste: burn it. Okay, this is the real McCoy. This is current reactors. You take 250 tons of natural uranium, you enrich it, you get 35 tons. This stuff is passed away, they don't know what to do with it yet. You run this through a, uh, a uh, nuclear power plant, you end up with 35 tons of spent fuel, of uh, high level spent fuel that will be radioactive for about 400,000 years. And this is the pump that's contained. This is for a generation four reactor, which can burn uranium itself and thorium. Here they're using thorium to take one ton of natural thorium. It's equivalent to the power you would get in uh, 250 tons of natural uranium burning using 35 ohm. You run it through the reactor, you have one ton of fission products, you have no trans uranium elements. Within 10 years, 83% are stable and can be uh, taken up and uh, sold. The remaining 17% here is what you have to start, and it only has to be stored for about 300 years instead of 400,000 years. So let's just take a look at uh, the difference between what is now currently used in, in nuclear reactors. Here you have thermal vision, and uh, you hit the U-235, that's the only thing that, 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 that is uh, fuel for a thermal fission. 
it splits and you get three neutrons. Uh, the neutrons go until they meet the moderator. Now, most of the neutrons are absorbed, but all you need is to have one neutron survive, be slowed down by a moderator, so it's slow, and hit another U-235 and split in. As long as you have at least one neutron that keeps on going, you are going to uh, uh, you are going to uh, uh, sustain the reactor. For fast fission, this is what takes place in the generation four reactors. You have a fast neutron, and it will hit a U-233. You note, note the change in the fuel, U-233. It has a lower cross-section, lower probability to, to absorb it, but the concentration of U-233 and the initial U-235 to get it started will have to be about 35%. As long as it's, it's uh, large enough and the uh, size is, is uh, uh, above the critical mass, it will cause sufficient numbers of fissions. Notice that there's now five neutrons. You get more neutrons per fission, and one will go on to fission another U-233, but notice that one of them went into the thorium-232, uh, and when you have the fission, the thorium-232 turned into 233. What happens to that one? Well, this is thorium-232, captured the neutron, thorium-233, Beta decay in 22 minutes, get pro actinium 233. 27 days later, it will decay the uranium 233, which is fissionable and is fueled. So, in a fast reactor, as long as you can, you can put in thorium and you gradually turn it into a missile uh, uh, fuel. Same thing can happen to uranium, but in this case, the same process brings you to plutonium, which is also just how it occurs. So what happens in these generation four reactors, you're gradually turning a fertile uh, material into a fissile fuel. So you can burn it all, all the two, U-238 and all the thorium can be burned as a fuel. Now I'm just going to skip along here to the punchline because it's getting late. Energy returned on investment. This is the energy you require to make a energy system work divided by the amount of energy you get out. Let's take a look at coal, at uh, oil at the beginning of the century or in 1930. Oil had an ERI of 100. But as time went on, it got harder and harder to extract this oil from the uh, fields, and that means more energy had to go in to get the same amount of oil out. So the EROI had to be fallen, so about 1970 it was about 30. Domestic oil in the United States today has an EROI of about 11. The tar sands, Canada's great national resource, has an EROI of about 5. It takes off. A lot of energy to get that that uh, that fuel out, and this is why our emissions are going up as we're extracting uh, human fuel for export overseas. Here is a uh, calculation done by uh, Weiss, Back, and all in the, the negative energy. They uh, have calculated the ROIs for current uh, uh, energy systems. Nuclear power as it exists today is 75. Hydro is 49. This 35 means hydro is not available all the time. You have to store some of the energy in order to, uh, to, to uh, really make it go. So the energy required in storage drops the ER all to 35. Coal is 30. Combined cycle gas turbine is 28. Solar is 19 and drops to 9 for storage reasons. Wind is 16. I've seen estimates saying it's 19 and drops to 3.9 for storage reasons. Get down here to solar. You're into uh, 3.9 here for, uh, for photovoltaic in Germany. I've seen 
estimates that say around six. So if you're going to build a lot of renewable energy structures, and you've got e or e ROIs of, uh, of uh, five and ten and whatnot, you're going to have to build, there's going to be a lot of infrastructure to build enough power, output the power of the world, like 3.8 million wind turbines, etc. 49,000 concentrated solar power plants, 1.5 billion rooftop of paying business. That's going to require an awful lot of capital and an awful lot of materials. Let's take a look at the generation four reactors. This is the ER05. It's estimated to be 2,000. That's because what used to be uh, uranium, which has only had 0.7% fuel, which was uh, uranium 235, the rest was 238. The whole thing now becomes fuel. So you're expanding a uranium at least about a factor of 150. And then you have all this thorium now in the fuel. So the uh, the uh, ROI increased remarkably. Now, if you take a ton of metal, that's about uh, a cubic meter, uh, a cubic meter, one cubic meter is about a ton of coal. With the present nuclear reactors with an ERO 575, that ton of coal is going to be replaced by a, a marble of enriched uranium that is 1.5 centimeters in diameter, a whole ton of coal. When that coal is burned, you get 3.7 tons of carbon dioxide, which will occupy a cubic volume of 12 meters on the side. That's how big it is. So it's one meter to 12 meters on the side. For a uh, generation four reactor, that 1.5 centimeter marble shrinks down to a speck. Okay. I argue that's the energy for the future. Also, I showed you that oil was dropping as an EROI. Nuclear is increasing. This is what they use gas diffusion to enrich the fuel. This is centrifuge diffusion, I mean centrifuge uh, enrichment. And then once you go to generation four, it goes to 2000. It's the only energy system the EROI is increasing. So, I would say nuclear power provides us with one of the safest, most cost effective sources of energy. We should be moving vigorously towards the increase of the nuclear energy supply. Right now, we should be building generation three reactors as fast as we can do it. The waste storage is to be used as a future source of fuel and build generation four reactors when they become available. Thank you, thank you very much. That was really informative. I hope we've all uh, learned a lot. Uh, we have a few minutes for some questions. So, um, shall I let you field the questions? Um, or no, well, I'll let you. Okay, so there's a question from the creature. Um, so, I have your if we hear facilities are somehow like one of the cheaper options to create energy, uh, why did uh, or how come facilities don't get turned over like in terms of like how can Fukushima didn't get changed over to like a more efficient system that that could have like just easily you know not had the issue that it had. Like if it was cheaper, you would think that they would also just switch it over. You you still have to shut it down and, and build it, and then still have capital costs. Depends on Pepco whether they're willing to uh, shut down a reactor and then engage in building it. I mean, they're not cheap still, but uh, uh, the, the cheapness of, of uh, nuclear energy is not in the construction; it's in the operating of it. The uh, Fuel is so cheap that it runs for a long time, and that's where you get your payback is from running the uh, reactors for a number of years. The uh, reactors at Fukushima had uh, already paid for themselves and were producing a nice profit, so 
but as we call it, uh, the inertia of profits that kept them from replacing the Would you know how many new nuclear plants would be able to replace the site C hydrogen? Uh, how much power is going to be produced from the site C plant? That's what I need to know. One, one gigawatt? Okay, just, okay, just, 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 just one nuclear power plant. Nuclear power plants are on the order of one gigawatt each. And the, uh, the uh, generation three, the AD 1000, I think it's produced by General Electric, Westinghouse, one of those two. Their, their standard uh, off the shelf design, which you can grab it, they didn't want that. That's a gigawatt power. Uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> uh, do, can we trust, um, so for this worldwide implementation, uh, can we trust um, some uh, politically unstable countries uh, to run these uh, power plants safely? Uh, I mean, I, can, I trust you know, more developed countries that have very high standards of safety. Uh, uh, should we be wary of? Politically unstable problems. Uh, running a nuclear power plant is not a good way of producing material for a, a bomb. That's what you're thinking of. If, uh, if you run it, you can get too much other isotopes contaminating the plutonium 39. Yeah, I know that's one issue, but also in terms of uh, dealing with the radioactive waste at the end. Well, just, safe, just safety standards in countries that are not yeah, as advanced. And, you know, threats from terrorism or just other, not necessarily creating or other, just general safety standards. Well, I mean, you, 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 you try to keep it under control with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, if a country wants to produce an atomic bomb, then the information is there how to produce it. They can go ahead and do it. All you need is centrifuges or seconds. That's what uh, Iran is was to. So there's one more question here and then up there and as well. So about the this point here, actually uh, now it's much easier to produce the bomb uh, weapons material from centrifuges than so it's much easier now because the center fusion is much cheaper, much easier to build. So a country wants to build the nuclear, uh, nuclear power now, nuclear weapons now, they really have to go through the center fusion, both nuclear weapons. Right, so you're saying it's that... It's take a long time, and lots of work, lots of money to separate the plutonium from the rest of the stuff. So the reactors are not really good for that. My concern was not really about the nuclear just so, when you produce this energy, you have this nuclear material. Yeah. Very okay, energy. what are they going to do with it? Very amount into yeah. our trash. Well, How do we know someone's not going to just dump it in the sea? Or, well, you know, there's going to be a political uprising and the safe running of this plant is not going to fall apart. That was more my concern. I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, the world is a um, unstable place. I don't know how you're going to guarantee anything, actually. But, uh, uh, I mean, if you have the generation four reactors, for example, your waste that's going to be produced is uh, only going to be there for about uh, a few hundred years. So, uh, the, the huge quantities of high level waste, and and actually, the, the huge quantities of high level waste are not all that huge because, you know, how much coal can be represented by 1.5 marble of, of rich uranium? And, uh, that's quite easy to start. So I did see two more question hands raised yet. So uh, Rose and then, and then Stuart, and then we'll probably then we'll have to uh, wrap it up at that point. So. So there's a Canadian novel somewhere about uranium miners, you think? Uh, 
Um, Stuart, you had a, a question as well? Yeah, so uh, near the end, you started talking about that Gen 4 reactors more, and uh, their question was simply when is this estimated reactor to be available? Because it seems very optimistic, which is great, but at the same time, like, it's not great if it's 20 years out. Well, I've seen estimates as low as five years, and it's not that they've never run these type of reactors before. They have pilot projects that have used them. Uh, I would say five to 20 years. But in the meantime, you can put in the uh, generation three. Store that field for the generation four. So, Yes. Okay. Um, if, uh, so like if something went bad, uh, you know, you, you kind of talked about the radiation in Chernobyl, for example. Uh, the, what about like the toxicity of the radiation from a different chemical type, such as thorium? Because like, I don't know if I don't know if it actually changes. This isn't my field of study, so like I don't know if it changes depending on the the uh, the isotope. Um, well, the seabird is the seabird, no matter where, you, where it came from. True. Yes. So, uh, I mean, you can talk about, let's say, uh, you, can, you can have polonium. You can take a microgram of polonium and, and swallow it. <coughs> that will kill you. But that's because it has such a, a short half life at, uh, and it's an alpha emitter. And it will. Uh, it's very dangerous if you have it, but trying to get a hold of microgram of polonium is, is uh, quite difficult. In fact, old fish have polonium in uh, very small quantities. That's perfectly safe, safe, safe to eat it. Uh, on Bukhari Beach, that's thorium, and it's got a long radioactive decay chain. And in those elements, there are plenty of uh, alpha emitters. Swallow that stuff too. And I don't think anybody has died from that. So I generally regard uh, you just look at the seabirds you're getting, and it really doesn't matter where it's coming from. And it's, and it's, that's the damage that, that, that we have to Well, I want to thank everybody for coming, and um, we should thank uh, Dr. Patrick Walden one more time. There were a couple of other questions that wanted to be asked, uh, but it is past nine o'clock. But uh, perhaps uh, you're willing to stick around for a few minutes for people to come up and, and chat as well. So thank you, and have a good evening.